Um, today we're going to talk about reverse genetics and global gene function discovery. So here's the roughly stated the, the case for genetics, and that's establishing causality. Um, so causality denotes a necessary relationship between one event, the cause, and another event, the effect, which is the consequence of the di direct consequence of the of the cause. So using the scientific method, scientists set up experiments to determine causality in the physical world. That is pretty much what uh, we're doing with a lot of uh, of genetics. So here's uh, the current state of a million genome annotation, um, which is a rationale for data-driven research. So here what we've done is we've plotted the most uh, studied gene in the human genome down to the least studied genes in the human genome um, and ranked them um, on the number of publications per gene. And here we have P53, TNF, VEGF, EGFR, ER, NF-kappa-B, et cetera. And what you can tell is that there's relatively few genes that are studied many, many, many times, and then about 23,000 genes that all have collectively about uh, less than five papers. And in fact, about half the genes in the genome don't have any papers describing their function. So the long and short of it is um, there's a relatively small component of the genome that's actively being published and funded, and a huge chunk of the genome that isn't being worked on at all. Um, and so genetics is, is one way to find the, the understudied component of the genome, um, the, the new drug targets, the new disease genes, and, um, and begin to uh, generate uh, resources and scientific findings to describe how exactly they do what they do. So we're going to talk about the role of reverse genetics in the global discovery of gene function today. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction on uh, the rationale, techniques, and approaches. And then I'm going to tell you about some use cases, first using um, yeast um, and then using um, mammalian cells. And, and, but I'd like to also note that um, this reverse genetics works in many different other model organisms, notably in C. elegans and Drosophila, where many of these methods uh, have been pioneered. So uh, first, the difference between forward and reverse genetics. John Murray gave you a lecture on forward genetics. Um, so the difference between forward genetics and reverse genetics is forward genetics starts with a phenotype, and then you try later to determine what gene caused that phenotype. Reverse genetics starts with uh, the gene, you know, generating a knockout or a knockdown of a particular gene, and then figuring out what the phenotype is um, that, that, that's a consequence of that knockdown. So just a little comparison of the two methods. With forward genetics, it can, it, it, the mutagenesis can be quick. Um, in the case of a, uh, a dominant screen, or a little bit longer in the case of a recessive screen, which can take months. And then the phenotyping can take months to years, and the cloning can take months to years. Whereas re with reverse genetics, this often takes months to years to, to knock out every gene in an organism. And then it can, the phenotyping can take place in days to weeks. And because the gene is already cloned and identified, this step is, is uh, largely a lookup table, and so that's practically instantaneous. So yeast are a, a premier model organism, um, not just for reverse genetics, but for, for genetics uh, period. And that's because they're relatively small and have a short generation time. They have a compact genome and really elegant genetic strategies. Um, many important pathways, for example, the cell cycle were first described in yeast. Um, it was the first sequenced eukaryotic organism in 1996. And uh, shortly afterwards, the community began to develop a barcoded deletion strategy to target every gene in the yeast genome. Um, and because of that, uh, the, the re resources to do reverse genetics are, are, uh, are, are, uh, are very robust in yeast. There's also an extensive protein-protein interaction network which can make taking the, the results from the reverse genetic experiments and integrating them with other data sets a lot more elegant. So the way they set up to do the reverse genetics in yeast was using barcoded deletion collections, where you're using homologous recombination. You take a gene of interest over here and target it with homologous recombination to disrupt the gene, in this case with this canamycin cassette, which is flanked by two barcodes um, which are unique for each, for, for each strain of interest. Um, and then you can read out the actual presence of a particular strain simply by, um, by reading the barcode. And so this will be 
better ex uh, explained on this slide. Many different strains can be monitored simultaneously. So here we have uh, different yeast strains, all denoted by a different color barcode over here. And when you want to detect them all, you simply uh, design PCR primers that flank the barcodes, amplify them, hybridize them to a DNA array, and read out the presence of each strain over here with these in intended features. And what that lets you to do, what that allows you to do, is to monitor um, the population before and after some selection. So, for example, before the selection, we have one, two, three, four, five different strains, and we hybridize the, the array, and we can detect those strains. And after the selection, we have twice as much of this strain, um, this strain, this strain, this strain, and now we're missing the strain over here, so the, the white strain is gone. And so we're, de we're detecting the deletion of one strain and the application of another strain simply by reading out the barcodes. So the selections can be many different things. They can be energy sources. For example, changing the carbon source, as in um, Winsler et al., Science 1999. They can be changing environmental conditions. For example, uh, challenging the yeast with oxidative stress. Um, for example, from Tuckett et al., Comparative and Functional Genomics 2004. They could be using different drugs, for example, ant antifungals, um, as in this PNAS paper. Or, and, and the method takes advantage of several different concepts. Um, sometimes it takes advantage of haploinsufficiency, for example, cell growth, um, when one of two copies is removed. And it can also take advantage of synthetic interactions between two, for example, non-lethal uh, non genes. So here's an example, um, uh, growth in the presence of atorvastin, an anti-cholesterol drug. This is from the PNAS paper, Giever et al., PNAS 2004. And what you can see is that um, at zero micromolar of atorvastin, which is a cholesterol inhibitor, um, all of the strains, the wild-type strain and then the HMG1 uh, and HMG2 knockout strains, are growing at pr practically the same rate. When the concentration of atorvastin is raised to 62.5 micromolar or 125 micromolar, you can see that HMG1, which is the, the principal CoA reductase in yeast, um, has the biggest effect. Either deletion of one or two copies is having a pretty strong effect. This is one copy, this is two copies, this is one copy, this is two copies. And then at 250 micromolar, uh, all four strains are producing, uh, producing an effect, growing slower than they would in the absence of the drug. So question one, these screens don't work well for genes that A, are in the cell cycle, B, make yeast grow faster, C, are lethal when deleted, or D, have few paralogs? And the answer is, are lethal when deleted. Um, they might not work well for a cell cycle gene if it was lethal when deleted, they work just as well for, for yeast that grow faster when they have genes deleted. And um, in this particular case, it doesn't really matter if they have a few paralogs or more paralogs. It's more important is that, uh, is that you, can't, you can't actually test the biology, biology of a gene if you can't actually grow the strain up because it's lethal. So as I mentioned earlier, there are reverse genetics um, methods in many other different model organisms. Just sort of for a sort of short rundown here, in C. elegans, there's RNAi in embryos. You can simply feed RNAi reagents to C. elegans. They'll eat them, and it works. It's incredible, but true. Um, in Drosophila, there's RNAi methods you can use in Drosophila in cells. There's also uh, ways to do RNAi in adult organisms. There's also P. element insertions, knocking out gene function for a chunk, a, a big chunk of the Drosophila genome. In mice, there are RNAi in cells. There's also an ES cell library knocking out more than 10,000 genes from the COMP project. And there are many other model organisms where reverse genetics is, is being rapidly sort of expanded as a, a method of choice for genome-wide gene functionalization studies. So let's talk a bit about the RNA interference-based reverse genetics. So RNAi, obviously described first by um, NC elegans by Andy Fire and Craig Mello. It was the, um, recognized by the Nobel Prize. It works by catalytically degrading complementary targets to a double-stranded RNA. These double-stranded RNAs can be transfected in as long dsRNA complexes or short siRNA complexes, um, or introduced in short hairpin encoding vectors. 
in mammals, long double-stranded RNAi can induce the interferon response. So um, typically, you would use small interfering RNAs rather than the longer dsRNAs. So here's a graphical representation. Here's an siRNA duplex up here in A. And from a longer double-stranded RNA, you can have a dicer chop up this dsRNA to produce the shorter siRNAs. Um, and then these siRNAs can then interact with the target message and cause catalytic degradation. Now, the disadvantage of RNAi is that it has um, off-target effects. So RNAi reagents often target more than one gene at a time. Um, these are typically transcripts with close sequence homology. And although you can design algorithms that try to avoid close homologs when picking out siRNA or dsRNA sequences, um, it's, in practice, they're almost impossible to avoid because it's not always immediately evident um, what, what regions will be, uh, will be recognized by, by more than one message. So a couple different methods have been developed to overcome these sequence-dependent off-target effects. The first method, and probably the most popular method, is redundancy. And it's simply asking that more than one siRNA pair generates the same phenotype in a cellular assay. So you simply ask, do I have more than one siRNA produce the same phenotype? If the answer is yes, it's probably an on-target effect. And if the answer is no, um, you may have to try more siRNAs designed elsewhere in the gene. Or it, if it turns out that you can't find another one, it could very well be that the original result was an off-target effect. A second method to overcome sequence-dependent off-target effects is to do rescue or complementation of your phenotype. In this case, you'll have one single siRNA that gives you an effect. And you'll introduce a cDNA um, where you have one or more mutations in the, the targeted mRNA and ask, if this does rescue the siRNA phenotype, then it's probably an on-target effect. If it doesn't rescue the RNAi phenotype, um, the siRNA may still work to target the mRNA. That's possible. Um, sometimes you have to put in more than one mutation, or it could very well be an off-target effect. So these are the two most common methods. Okay, let's turn a little bit um, and discuss assay development. So you're developing, but before we do that, let's talk about another question. In screening, redundancy is used much more often than rescue because A, you usually screen more than one RNAi reagent per gene anyway. B, it's easier to screen um, more siRNAs than mutagenize and test a cDNA. C, both, or D, neither. And the answer is both. You usually screen more than one RNAi pair um, anyway, and uh, B, it's easier to screen uh, more siRNAs than it is to mutagenize and test a cDNA. So in practice, unless you're screening double-stranded RNAs or where you're targeting essentially the whole message, typically what you do is screen more than one independent siRNA. So to return to assays, there are many different types of assays, and these can be simple reporter gene assays where you have, for example, a promoter fused to a reporter gene such as firefly luciferase. Um, there can be many different types of imaging assays, um, ones that look at protein localization within a cell, modification of a particular protein, for example, an antibody that recognizes the phosphorylated but not unphosphorylated forms. Um, you can uh, use more than one label and look at cell or organelle size or number. Um, you can look at changing morphology of cells. Um, you can look at protein interactions using FRET or BRET-like techniques. And many of these techniques also allow you to, to look at, at the dynamics of a particular uh, signaling event, so looking at kinetic screens. So here's how the, the process typically works. You'll start with an idea, something I want to look at. For example, I want to interrogate um, the circadian clock in a mammalian cell. You'll come up with an idea of what reporters, what cell types, what phenotypes you're really interested in. You'll think about what positive and negative controls you might want to, to use in your assay development process. You'll take a look around your lab and see what type of infrastructure I have, either locally or possibly at my university, um, just to make sure that the type of screen you want to do is the equipment is there to actually do it. Then. You'll take the idea of your screen, and you'll begin to do the assay development phase, where, where you will vary things like the cell type, the cell number, um, for example, solvent, or the timing of addition of reagents. And you'll look at, uh, at the statistical performance of, of your screen, something called a Z-factor, which we'll discuss in a slide or two, 
and um, at, at how the, the assay changes when you, when you do it on day one versus day two, or well-to-well -well or plate-to-plate -plate variability issues. And then you'll test the scale, test the screen, usually in a, a small set, like looking at a relatively small number of, uh, of genes, for example, a 1,000 uh, siRNA set. And you'll do some data analysis on that small test set. And then when things look good, you'll scale up and run your full assay. So typically, this process can take between one and six months. Sometimes your, your idea can never be, can never be um, uh, done in screen form. It's just for one reason or the other, biology doesn't work very well in 384 or 1536 well format. But usually, when you put enough time and effort into it, you can build a screen that, that, uh, that, that, can, that, can, that can be used in a genome scale assay. So the Z factor. So how do you score? We typically use a z-factor, which is a common industry measure of assay performance. And it's roughly a measure of the effect size um, versus uh, of the positive and negative controls. So your estimated z-factor is given by the equation 1, 3 minus the standard deviations of your positive and, and negative controls added over the absolute value of the difference in sample means between the positive and negative controls. If your Z factor is one, that's pretty much a perfect screen. You have perfect separation between your positive and negative controls and zero variance. Um, a Z factor of 0.5 to one is, is outstanding and well worth screening. Between 0.25 and five, it's probably still good enough to run a screen. Um, marginal, if it's barely positive, zero to, to 0 0.25. And if it's less than zero, it's not a good assay and you should really return to the assay development stage. Um, choose a different cell type use different cell numbers in that well, grow them at confluence, grow them at subconfluence, do something else to figure out how to get the assay better. Okay, given a, a distribution of data, what is the z-score for this assay? You're going to need a calculator here, at least in Excel um, or, or spreadsheet. The answer is 0.53. So it's a good assay, it's well worth running, and something you should pursue. So we talked a bit about, um, about the different uh, types of assays you have. Here's a slide that sort of depicts that information. Um, here are plate reader-based assays up in the upper left-hand corner, things like uh, looking at luciferase or laxi um, assays. They're fast and they're quantitative, um, and they're uh, re relatively poor in information content, so there's not a lot of information there. There's also... Um, plate screens that can look at cell number and, and phosphorylation, which you can also do at a plate level. Or there are the microscopy-based screens where you can look at a myriad of phenotypes. Here we have a three-color stain of cells looking at the nucleus, the, some component of the cellular um, internal machinery, and then the cell membranes here. So you can really do a lot with the microscopy-based screens. However, they tend to be um, more difficult to do assay development-wise. Um, it takes a lot of time to read these plates, and the data analysis is not trivial. So here's sort of an example of a screen. Um, we're going to talk today about the loss of function screens down here, which roughly um, are, uh, are analogous to uh, small mole molecule antagonist screens. Um, here's some of the automation that's... It's, uh, fairly robust and used widely in laboratories all over the, all over the world. Standard 3D four-well plates, 3D four-well liquid handlers, and then multi-mode plate readers that can read out different assays. Um, the data looks uh, relatively messy. Um, so uh, like the DNA arrays we talked about earlier, there's lots of things that can happen. You can have scratches in your array. Here on, on, the, uh, on these functional assays, you have all of the disadvantages of CDN arrays and then some. These are live cells that are living here. So you could end up with, uh, with row effects where you have spotting issues. So here you can see several rows. The nozzles here might be clogged. So you're having row effects here. You can also have evaporation. Evaporation tends to occur on the outside lanes. So here you can see some of the evaporation that might be occurring in these plates. Actually, if you put a 3D four-well plate on, uh, with, with water at 37 degrees on a balance, you can actually watch the evaporation occur in real time. That's how prevalent uh, evaporation is. Okay, question four. 
You just ran a screen and 90% of the hits came from one plate. Is this likely? This is great. Sure, A, a this is great. This, this will make hit picking a lot easier. B, this is probably a plate artifact. We need to look at the raw data. Or C, it just happened that way. The answer is obviously B. It's probably a plate artifact. Unless you plated out the hits, uh, or plated out the genes by, by, for example, by pathway, and they're all on one plate, um, the most likely thing is that you had some issue with the plate, nozzles clogging or evaporation or, or some aspect of the screen that didn't go well, and you need to look really hard at the raw data to see if you can figure out what happened. Um, so here's an example of a, a screen looking at kinetics. And this is a screen where we're looking at the performance of a reporter, a promoter driving luciferase over time, so every two hours for four days. And so in this particular screen, we needed a robotic system that could measure each uh, siRNA pair in each of the 3D four well plates a total of uh, every two hours for four days. And so here the system is adding nucleic acid, uh, is adding uh, transfection reagents to the plate to solubilize the nucleic acids. Then it's going to add about three to 5,000 cells per plate to solubilize the, to, and perform the reverse transfection. And then it's going to take each one of these plates, it's going to put it in an incubator um, for a day, and then it's going to pull out a plate every two hours for four days. So a total of nearly five million points, and all done in an automated fashion. So here's an overview of the primary screen. Um, here's all of the data on the left-hand side, period, fitted for period length or amplitude. And over on the right-hand side is sort of a plate-level view of period and amplitude um, with controls. So here's the normal period of the clock, around 24 hours. Here, here's a gene that makes the clock a long period or a positive control, CRY2. And you can see that most plates CRY2 uh, was included as a control, and it, it gave the appropriate result. Here's a similar thing for amplitude. Here's the amplitude across the screen. The first few plates had something a little bit weird with them, but then it became more stable. And then here's the performance of the amplitude control, in this case, BMAL1. And you can see that it looks pretty good. So for HIT validation, um, because sRNAs that kill cells will also kill the clock, we steered clear of low amplitude. Um, hits and only focused on period length and high amplitude phenotypes. We required more than one siRNA pair per gene to hit in more than one assay um, for us to call it a hit uh, because of the well-described off-target uh, off target effects of siRNAs. We tested dozens of these hits in dose response to learn um, how, how they functioned. Were they, were they cliffy? Did they have an a, a effect um, at uh, very high concentrations but not at very low concentrations? or were they pr pretty much continuous? And where small molecules were available, we tested ag against the same hits, we tested those as well. So here are some, uh, some of the hits that we tested in dose response. Over here are, are genes that produced long period phenotypes. Here are some that produced short period phenotypes. Here are some known controls here. And then some of our new hits over here, circled in red. And here are some amplitude controls. Here's a known gene. Here's another known gene, and here's a couple of, here's a new gene that when you inhibit it, the clock function actually gets better. We also did pathway analysis. Here's mapping the hits to a particular pathway. Um, in this case, it's the insulin signaling pathway. It's about 40 steps. Um, genes that are in peach or purple are circadianly regulated in the liver, so that means that they have a circadian rhythm to their transcription in the liver. Genes that are in purple or blue when you inhibit them, actually change clock function in our cellular model. So these are, this is a pathway that is both regulated by the clock and also feeds back into clock function in cells. On the right-hand side, we have uh, more than one siRNA pair was chosen for uh, all the hits in the pathway. In the lower right-hand corner, because this pathway has been under intense pharmacological study, um, we have a lot of small molecules against various components, and we tested those as well and those also produce similar phenotypes to the siRNA pairs. So how would you decide what validated hits to follow up? There's lots of right answers to this question, but you should be thinking about things like the availability of other secondary assays. Are there animal models that you could uh, exploit to test and see whether or not these factors were interesting? Are particular pathways overrepresented? Are, is, there avail is there availability 
um, of other data sets that you could integrate to sort of focus you, you down on particular genes. And of course, you're going to be influenced by your biological interests and intuition. And that's that.